All right, so here we are with our covalent bonding worksheet. So at this point, depending on how far we got in class today, you might get to fast forward through some of this. So if we started these notes, just fast forward through the vodcast until you find something that does not look familiar. Otherwise, um, we'll start from the very beginning with a story up at the top. So I want you to imagine that it's like summer vacation and you're going to a barbecue and, and you hear that Maybe that special person will be there. Yes, that person who you really, really want to be there will be there. And so you look really good and you show up. And it turns out now for the story to work, we have to assume that you really, really like to eat meat. So if you're a vegetarian, just kind of roll with me on this one. So let's say you get to the party and they're having a nice barbecue. So you get yourself a hamburger on the plate and you're very, very excited and you look over and you see that person kind of sitting down by themselves and they have a hamburger on their plate, but they're not eating it. So you kind of sidle over and smile and say hello and sit down. And then it turns out that this person is a vegetarian. They're stuck with this hamburger that they really don't want. And you, on the other hand, love hamburgers. So what they end up doing is they give their hamburger to you. And you smile and say thank you, and they smile back, and it's the start of an awesome summer relationship. OK, so that's one way the story can go, is where you like meat, they're a vegetarian, they give you their hamburger, and that starts off your awesome summer relationship. There's another way that this story can go. Almost the same, but with a couple of details. Same party, same person there, you look fabulous, same uh, barbecue, but the difference being, let's say this time you still really like meat and the other person, that special person also really likes meat. So you have your hamburger there on a plate and you're going and you're heading toward, towards a table and you look back and that person that you really, really want to be there at that party, um, they got to the grill too late and they are all out of hamburgers. So they are walking away dejected. And that's when you step in and you go, hey, sit by me. I can split my hamburger in half and we can share it. You're not going to give them the whole thing because you're still hungry, but you're going to share the hamburger. Okay, so think about what we've just talked about here. Same story, two different ways. One way, you start your awesome summer relationship by them giving you a hamburger. In the second story, you start your awesome summer relationship by each sharing the hamburger. So now, how is this like bonding? Well, the bonding that we've learned about so far has been ionic bonding. And now let's review. Ionic bonding happens between a metal and a non-metal. And then it happens when one atom gives a number of valence electrons. It doesn't matter how many. It can be one all the way up to four. Gives valence electrons to the other. And that's what causes them to bond. You then have that positive cation attracted to that negative anion, and that kind of sticks them together, and that's what creates the bond. So that's kind of like our first story with them, them giving you their hamburger. That starts off your awesome summer relationship. It's like someone's giving a valence electron or a hamburger. That's not the only way that atoms can bond together, though. Ionic is, like we said, it's metal and nonmetal. There's another way, though, that's called covalent. And covalent bonding occurs between nonmetals only. No metals are involved. So covalent bonding happens between nonmetals. And that's more like our second story. If you remember that second story, we have our little hamburger up here. That's where the the hamburger gets shared between two people. And that's what happens in covalent bonding. Nonmetals share valence electrons rather than someone giving them away. And we'll spend more time in a little while looking at how that sharing thing works. But for now, let's um, bop down here to this chart where it says Lewis dot structures. And we'll take a look at 
some specific terminologies and pictures that we use to talk about atoms and their valence electrons. So the first thing I'd like you to do is take a look on your periodic table and fill in this first column for me, the number of valence electrons. I give you five non-metals. And what I'd like you to do is go ahead and, again, look on your table and fill in the number of valence electrons. So pause and come back in a moment. Okay, so hopefully you found carbon has four, chlorine has seven, oxygen has six, phosphorus has five, and hydrogen has one. Now remember, with the exception of hydrogen, which does not follow the octet rule, all four of these ones up here are following something called, remember, the octet rule. Eight is great. Everybody wants eight valence electrons. So let's bop over. We're going to skip the middle column for now. And let's bop over here. The number of additional electrons needed to satisfy the octet rule or duet rule, but we'll get to that in a second. So if everybody wants eight, let's kind of do a little comparison here. Carbon has four. In order to get to eight, it needs four additional electrons. Chlorine has seven. In order to get to eight, it needs one. Oxygen has six. You're kind of hopefully getting the pattern and doing the math ahead of me. Oxygen has six. It needs two. And phosphorus has five, which means it requires three more. Now, hydrogen, remember, is the exception along with helium. These two elements follow the duet rule. They just need two valence electrons in order to be satisfied, in order to be stable. So if hydrogen starts out with one, it's only going to need one more. OK, so let's go back then to this column that we skipped here. The new thing, because all of this so far in this chart has been kind of reviewed, the new thing is something called a Lewis dot structure. And this is a picture that we use to show valence electrons. And now there are some rules, but I'm going to show those to you kind of as we go through these different examples. OK, I want you to imagine this is going to be our symbol X here is going to represent kind of any, any element. It's nothing in particular. It's just going to be kind of our placeholder. I want you to imagine that there are kind of parking spaces all around this element, kind of on four sides. Each parking side has room for two valence electrons. So let's kind of see how that might come into play here down with carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons. So here's how we draw the Lewis dot structure for carbon. We put a carbon, its symbol, in the middle. And then I start putting electrons around the outside. Remember how we have these four kind of areas, each one can hold two. What I don't want to do is smush them all together on two sides. The way that valence electron Lewis dot structures work is that you put the electrons one on every side first, and then you start doubling up. So let's see, for carbon, what that means is we're going to put one here, one there, one there, and one there. Over on the side here, I'm going to show you what's wrong. This is what I don't want you to do. A wrong variation would be if you said, okay, carbon needs four, you can fit two on a side, one, two, three, four. That's wrong. I'll even change to red so you know. Don't do that. They spread out evenly one on every side before they start doubling up. Okay, let's bop down to chlorine next. So the symbol goes in the middle. We have seven valence electrons in this picture. So we start by doing one on each side first, one, two, three, four, and then we can double up, five, six, seven. So two, one side has only one valence electron, and then all the other three sides each have two. For oxygen, symbol in the middle, six valence electrons, one on each side first, one, two, three, four, and then I start filling in five, six. Now somebody always asks the great question, well, do these two um, pairs have to be right next to each other? In other words, could I draw something that looks like that? And the answer is yes, absolutely. The key thing though is that you spread them out one on every side first and then go back and start doubling up. Phosphorus. P has five. One, 
two, three, four, and then five. And again, this pair can go on any side. You just have to make sure that there's only one pair. And then for hydrogen now, hydrogen just has one valence electron, so we're just going to put a dot right there. So again, this is Lewis dot structures, and what we're going to learn in class next is how these are going to help us figure out how covalent bonding happens. Remember, we've mastered ionic at this point, metals and nonmetals. Covalent is going to help us figure out what happens between nonmetals when they share.